We'll begin the course with a discussion of limits. First of all, I want to sort of address the notational issue. When we write something like I've displayed here, we're asking the following question. What is happening to that expression x squared plus 1 as x gets closer and closer to 1? Look at that notation and see how I get that information out of that expression. In particular, look at the way we're going to write this and read it. The LIM is read as the word limit. Underneath that, the X with the arrow pointing to the right toward the number 1 is read X approaches 1. So that entire expression would be read as the limit of X squared plus 1 as X approaches 1. Keep in mind here, we're not particularly concerned about the value at the number, in this case at 1. We only want to know, with the concept of limit, what happens as x gets close to that value, in this case a 1. Keeping that in mind, there are still two directions from which you could approach 1. You could approach 1 coming from smaller values than 1, in other words, approaching from the left, or you could approach one from larger values going to the right toward one. So even within the issue of what happens to the expression as, as x gets close to one, we have to worry about directionality as well. If we're coming from the left toward one, we call that a left-hand limit. If we're coming from the right toward one, we call that a right-hand limit. Notationally, if we want to indicate a left-hand limit, we go down to the, in this case a 1, the number that the arrow points to, and put a superscript of a minus sign. That indicates we're looking at a left-hand limit, or we're interested in a left-hand limit. On the other hand, if we're coming from the right, we use a superscript of a plus. So negative doesn't mean negative number. In fact, I would just think of it as a, as a minus sign. It just means coming from the left. And the plus sign doesn't necessarily mean positive. It just simply means coming from the right. Let's go back now and look at each type of limit individually. Let's first start with the left-hand limit. I'm interested in what happens to the expression following the LIM, in this case, x squared plus 1, as x approaches 1 from the left of 1. What happens to the value of x squared plus 1? Well, think of it this way. If you think of some values fairly close to 1 but smaller than 1, and think of getting closer and closer to 1, you might try something like 0.9, which is definitely less than 1. 0.99 is less than 1 but closer to 1. And you can just keep adding 9s. 0.999 is close to 1 on the left of 1. but closer to 1 than 0.99, and so on. And if you look at that and make a chart and, and compute these values, for every x value, starting with the 0.9, if you plug in and do 9 squared plus 1, you'll get about 1.810. If you plug in 0.99, again, your calculator is very useful here, you'll get about 0.19801. And if you put in 0.999, square it and add 1, you'll get about 1.9988001. It's sort of easy to see that those values, as you're squaring them and adding 1 to it, are getting closer and closer to the number 2 as x gets closer and closer to 1. You see the pattern emerging. When that happens, we simply say that the left-hand limit of that expression is equal to 2. It's the thing that the values of the x squared plus 1 approaches as x gets close to 1 from the left. Now let's do the same thing with the right-hand limit. This time we're approaching from the right, so we're taking values bigger than 1 but getting closer and closer to 1. So you might get something like, and again I'm moving from right to left here when I'm reading them off, 1.1 1 .1 
1.01, which is still to the right of 1, but closer to 1 than 1.1 is, or 1.001, which is still to the right of 1, but closer to 1 than the other two. And you could keep inserting zeros and getting, getting as close to 1 as you like. If you do the same thing, play the same game, make a chart, and calculate, if you plug 1.1 in, square it, and add 1, you'll get about 2.21. If you put in 1.01, you'll get approximately 2.0201. And if you put 1.001 in, you'll get about 2.002. And you can get as close to one as you want to. And as closer and closer you get, you'll come to the same conclusion as you did before, is that as x approaches 1, the value of x squared plus 1 is getting closer and closer to the number 2. So we say that the right-hand limit as x approaches 1 is 2 for that expression. That's what we mean by left and right-hand limits. Now let's take out the particular numbers. I started off with this with a particular example, but let's get rid of those. Instead of putting in x squared plus 1, let's just use any random function f of x some unspecified function f of x. And I used 1 as what x is approaching, but it could be anything. Let's just use the, the, the uh, number c. And the limit itself we'll call um, a. Now notice I said that both limits were equal to a. That mirrors what we did in the last example where both the left and right hand limits came out to be 2. So I'm trying to mirror that situation without using particular numbers. So if you calculate the left-hand limit for some function f as x approaches c from the left, and then you calculate the limit of that function as x approaches c from the right, and they both come out to the same number, we just call it a, then that means that the left and right-hand limits are equal to each other. And once you know that they're equal, there's really no need to distinguish from the left, from the right, because it's true in both cases, you can just drop the superscript minus and plus and just say the limit itself of x squared plus 1 as x approaches 1 is just that number a. Just like before we said the answer was 2 if the left and right hand limits are equal. So I'm just trying to generalize here and take out the particular values to show you that the, the uh, general idea. When the left and right hand limits are equal to each other, you can drop the plus minus superscripts and just say the limit itself is that number. Now let's go back to the results from our original example because I'm not done with it yet. We found out that the left hand limit was 2, the right hand limit was 2, and therefore what you might call the limit or the overall limit or the normal limit. The limit is probably the easiest way to say it, is 2. And that happens when the left and right hand limits are equal to each other. Now let's take a look at what's happening graphically because sometimes it's helpful to think about these things graphically. What if I think of x squared plus 1 as being the f of x that I generalized to earlier? You can draw that and you know that that's just a parabola. If you need to plot a few points you'll see that it looks pretty much like what I've displayed here. And when you're approaching 1, you can see what's going on in that graph. Let's take the left-hand limit first. That means we're looking at what's happening to the y value of a point moving along that curve from the left toward x equal 1. In other words, I'm going toward 1 on the x-axis. What's happening to the point on the curve as I get closer and closer to 1 from the left? For example, suppose I pick that point. It's to the left of 1, and you get something along the curve that I've indicated by that red dot. Now let's move a little bit closer to 1. If you move a little bit closer to 1, you get another y value. If you move even closer to 1, you get another y value. If you move even closer to 1, you get yet another y value. Can you sort of see that as you're inching your way toward 1 from the left, that the y values are inching them, themselves toward the value 2? So that's a graphical representation of what we did earlier.
Notice the answer is two. We knew it was two, but you, if we interpret it graphically, it gives you something to think about when you're doing these limits. You're looking at what, what happens to the y values of the function as the x values do something coming toward a number from either the left or the right. Let's do the same thing with the right-hand limit. This time we're looking at what, what's happening to the y value of a point moving along the curve, this time from the right side of one, but going toward one. So maybe you pick a value like that. That's definitely to the right of one. I want something close to one, but to the right of one. And then I want to move even closer. So I, I note the y value, and then I pick a point even closer. I pick a point even closer and note its y value. Then pick a point even closer and note its y value. And then pick a point even closer and note its y value. You can see again that the y value is approaching two. And again, you see that's the same answer we got earlier. So this looking at it graphically is just a way of helping you understand what's going on with these limits. And of course, if the left and right hand limits are equal to each other, you say that the limit is equal to that value for which both of those limits, left and right, are equal to. So here we would have, because the limit of x squared plus 1 as x approaches 1 from the left is 2, and the limit of x squared plus 1 as x approaches 1 from the right is 2, then the limit of x squared plus 1 as x approaches 1 is 2. So it's a graphical way of looking at what we did earlier strictly algebraically. And this sort of summarizes everything. Approaching from the left, left-hand limit. Approaching from the right, right-hand limit. If the left and right-hand limit limits equal each other, then you have the overall limit or the limit. Here's something that's going to be very much worth noting when you're doing your exercises and assignments. That function x squared plus 1 that we've been working with is just a particular instance of, of a polynomial function. In other words, powers of x, terms consisting of powers of x. You know, 3x squared plus 5x minus 7. You know, anything you can make up with powers of x strung together. Those are polynomial functions. For polynomial functions, it turns out that the left and right hand limits are always equal to each other. It wasn't a coincidence. We'll talk about why a little bit more in a later section. But they're always going to be equal to each other. And they're always going to be equal to what you'd get just by plugging that number C in in place of x. So when you're calculating limits, left hand, right hand, or just regular limits for polynomial functions, you really don't have to go through any torturous process of plugging in values on the left and right. You can just plug the value itself in and that'll be the answer. Well, that's a very nice thing to know. For example, if I gave you the limit of 4x cubed minus x squared plus 1 as x approaches 2, instead of saying, okay, I'm going to look to the left of, of 2 and get closer to 2, I'm going to look from the right of 2 getting closer to 2, and then you make charts and you figure it out like we did before, what this result says, no, if it's a polynomial function, you don't need to go to all that trouble. Just plug 2 into the polynomial and that answer is the answer. That's nice. It saves you from having to do all that work from left and right. And that's not always possible. With polynomial functions, it is always possible. So it's very easy to take limits involving polynomial functions. I want to take this example and sort of make a contrast between the method of tabling things and checking left and right and getting closer and closer and, and actually just using that little uh, worth noting comment I made earlier. Let's go back to before I made that little worth noting comment. And if I gave you that function and asked you to complete that table, I'm going to keep in mind that since that one is centered there in the middle of the chart, that I'm probably going to be interested in the limit as x approaches one. So if I think of it that way, I'm going to be thinking about coming in from the left and coming in from the right. So let's complete those y values with that thought in mind. So I'm going to start with the point 0.9. If you take point 0.9, plug it into the function, and use your calculator and calculate the y value, you'll come out with about negative 5.5900. And then do the same thing. You're getting closer to 1, do 0.99. If you do that calculation, you'll get about 0.5. You'll get about 5.9599. And then if you move even closer to 1 on the left and get 0.5, 
put in 0.999 into the calculation, you'll get about negative 5.9960. That suggests that the left-hand limit is going toward minus 6. Now let's come in from the right. So if I start from the far right, plug 1.1 into this function again and calculate, I'll get about negative 6.3900. Then if I move to 1.01, I'm getting a little bit closer to 1 from the right, and calculate, I'll get about negative 6.0399. And finally, 1.001 plugged in and calculated gives me about negative 6.0040. And again, that suggests that as you get closer and closer to 1 from the right, you're getting closer to negative 6. The idea of a limit doesn't really depend on there being a value at the point you're approaching. But since there is for a polynomial function, I'm going to go ahead and calculate it. Well, actually, there's a secondary reason as well. But even if there weren't a secondary reason, I calculate it because I can. That limit doesn't even have to exist. But in this case, if you plug a 1 in, you will get negative 6. And because the left and right hand limits are both equal to negative 6, you can say the limit itself for that function is negative 6. Now that's how we approached it when we started this discussion. But now let's go back and incorporate that comment I made about polynomial functions being easy to calculate limits for. Because what I said is if you have a polynomial function, you don't really have to do all these table values and go from left and right. You can just plug in. And if you plug one in, you'll get negative 6. So again, that little note about when you're dealing with polynomial functions, you can just plug in. It's extremely helpful. It makes a lot of these limits you'll be calculating very easy to do. Just have to remember that, that that is all you need to do. You get the same answer either way. It turns out, and we'll talk more about this later, it doesn't necessarily have to be a polynomial function for the, the plugging in technique to actually work. In fact, for most functions, when you're doing limits, if you can plug in and get a real number for an answer, most of the time that result is the limit you're looking for. So for example, if I gave you this nasty looking quotient and asked you to calculate the limit as x approaches 2, if you just plug 2 in, you'll end up with 7 over 1, which is 7. And that is, in fact, the limit. So for most of the problems you'll be dealing with, if you can plug in a value and get an answer, most of the time, that result will be the limit. There are special cases where that's not true and you'll come across some of those. But for the most part, if you can plug in and get an answer, you're probably going to have that as your limit result and be correct. If you had something even nastier, maybe it has a square root in it, but you're approaching 3, well, if you plug 3 in, you end up with the square root of 2 over 8. There you go. How about this one? The limit as x approaches 1 of the expression x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. This time you plug in a 1, and uh-oh, something happened. You got 0 over 0. Well, that's not a real number. So what does that mean? It turns out a 0, zero, zero over 0 is, a, is an indication that you can simplify that expression further before you plug in the limit. So anytime you try to plug in and get 0 over 0, back up is telling you that you can back up and simplify the expressions before, expression before you move on. So if I back up a little bit and try to simplify this expression before I plug in anything, you'll notice that the numerator is the difference of two squares. So I can factor that as x plus 1 times x minus 1. And once I do that, I can see that the x minus 1 in the numerator will divide out with the x minus 1 in the denominator, leaving me with just x plus 1 as the expression I'm taking the limit of. Now if you plug in the 1, you get a perfectly good answer of 2, and that is the correct answer. So that's nice. This plugging in works quite often. It saves you from having to go back and do left and right hand limits, and that should always be your last resort if there's some other way to do it. Here's another one. 
What if I give you the limit of x squared over the quantity x minus 1 as x approaches 1? Try plugging the 1 in. This time you get 1 over 0. Well, having a 0 in the denominator is always a problem. But before, if it was 0 over 0, it flagged it for being simplifiable. But if it's not 0 over 0, but it's something else over 0, that's an indication that the limit does not exist. Zero over zero is an indication that you can go back and simplify and get rid of the, the value that caused the division by zero and still get the right answer for the limit. But when you get something that's not zero over zero, that's simply an indication that the limit does not exist and we'll use D and E for does not exist to indicate that, that the, the limit in fact does not exist. As you practice these, you'll see how this goes. Let's go back to some graphical things. If you've got a graph of this function and someone asks you to calculate the left-hand limit as x approaches 3, that means you're getting closer and closer to, the, to x being equal to 3, but you're coming in from the left side of 3. So 3 is right there, and you're coming in from the left. That means you're sliding down this line segment but you're getting closer and closer to 3 and you can see when you do that you're getting closer and closer to that open circle which is at the value of 1 and that's your limit so when you get good at these interpreting these graphs the left and right hand limits and overall limits are, are trivially easy you just go down toward the value you're approaching from the right direction and cross reference back to the y-axis and that's your limit by the same token, if you want the right-hand limit, that means you're traveling at values bigger than 3, which means you're on this segment over here, and you're heading down toward this value, which is, of course, negative 3. So the left-hand limit as x approaches 3 of that function is 1. The right-hand limit is negative 3. And because the left and right-hand limits don't equal each other, the limit itself does not exist. The left and right hand limits are not equal to each other, so the limit itself does not exist. Now, those type of functions that I just drew a picture of, if you were actually to look at their algebraic format, they'd probably look something like this function. It's called a function defined by a rule, and you've seen those in your pre-calculus course. In this case, the function is defined by the expression x plus 1 as long as x is bigger than 3, and it's defined by the function 4 minus x whenever x is, is less than 3. It's called a function defined by a rule. And suppose now I want to find the left right hand limits and if it exists, the limit as x approaches 3. I'm interested in what happens as x gets close to this value where the rule changes. So I start off with the left hand limit. That means I'm getting close to 3 but less than 3. Well, if I'm getting close to 3, but I'm less than 3, that tells me I'm on the bottom rule, which is the 4 minus x. So as long as I'm coming in from the left of 3, I'm using the 4 minus x. And now I can just plug 3 in for x and get an answer of 1. You see how that works? The left and right hand limit refers you to which piece of the function to travel in on, just like the picture did earlier. And then if I want to do the right-hand limit, now I'm traveling along the values approaching 3, but from numbers bigger than 3. Bigger than 3 tells me that I'm using the x plus 1 as my rule. And so now I can plug 3 in for, one, uh, for x and get 3 plus 1, which is 4. So that's the right-hand limit. And again, because the left and right-hand limits are not equal to each other, the limit itself does not exist. So... Please practice this so that it doesn't bec become such a hard process. Once you see what's going on and what your flags are, when you see certain things, you behave in a certain way in terms of, of getting to a solution your easiest way. Once you learn all the ins and outs of that, this process of taking limits is really very easy. But it does take practice. I want to wrap up with some limit rules. I apologize in advance because they look sort of frightening when you first look at them. but I'm just putting them here for reference. I really don't think you even need most of them because most of them are intuitive. But I want them here for your reference 
for later on. But I do, as I go through there, I want to explain what they mean because saying what they mean is actually an easier way to remember them than trying to memorize them as they stand. But having said that, let me just get on with that. So I've got two functions, f and g. I'm taking the limit of each of them as x approaches c. For f of x, I get a limit of a. For g of x, I get a limit of b. Suppose I've, got, I've gotten that. Rule one, if k is a constant, then the limit of k as x approaches c is k, and the limit of k times f of x as x approaches c is simply k times the limit of f of x as x approaches c, and since the limit of f of x as x approaches c is equal to a, then that means it's k times a. Now that's a mouthful and it looks sort of off-putting, but all it's really saying is that the limit of a constant, in other words, the limit of a number is just that number. If I ask you to take the limit of a number, it's just the number, no matter what x approaches. And that if you're taking the limit of a number times a function, it's just going to be that number times the limit of the function. So for example, if I ask you to take the limit of 18 as x approaches 2, or anything really, it's just going to be 18. And if I give you a limit with a constant factor, say 2 times a function of x, I just made up something e of x, you can put that 2 out front and just say it's 2 times what's remaining. In other words, you can factor a constant factor can just be brought outside the limit. And of course, now if you plug in 0, you get e to the 0, and e to the 0 is 1, and 2 times 1 is 2. So the limit of a constant is just a constant. In other words, when you take the limit of a number, it's going to be the number. And if you've got a numerical factor inside the limit, you can bring it out front if you want. That's all that rule says. Number two says the limit of f of x plus or minus g of x as x approaches c is just the limit of f of x as x approaches c plus or minus the limit of g of x as x approaches c. In other words, you can take the limit term by term. The limit of a sum is the sum of the limits. The limit of a difference is the difference of a limit. You can just do it term by term. So if I knew that the limit of f of x was 16 as x approaches 4, and the limit of g of x was 8 as x approaches 4, and someone asked me to find the limit of f of x minus g of x, I would just say it's 16 minus 8. You can take limits term by term. That's all that says. 3. Same thing with the product. The limit of a product is the product of the limits. If I ask you to take the limit of two functions multiplied together, you can just take the limit of each one separately and multiply the answers together. So if the limit of f of x as x approaches c is 16, and the limit of g of x as x approaches 4 is 8, then the limit of f times g is just going to be 16 times 8. So like I said, I probably could have left off listing these rules and you still would have gotten the right answer because it's a very intuitive thing. You're doing the thing that seems intuitive and it actually works. That's a good thing. Number four, same thing with the quotient as with the product with the caveat that you can't divide by zero. So as long as you're not dividing by zero, the limit of a quotient is the quotient of the limits, as long as you're not dividing by zero. So if I told you the limit of f as x approaches 4 was 16 and the limit of g as x approaches 4 is 8, and I want you to find the limit of f divided by g, it would just be 16 divided by 8. Again, very intuitive. And the last one is the one we've been using already. If f is a polynomial, the limit of f as x approaches c is just what you get by plugging c in. And we've been doing that already. I just threw that in there for completeness. So you need to practice. Most of this stuff's intuitive. There are times maybe where you actually need to do a left-hand limit, right-hand limit by plugging in values and looking at what's happening to the, to the result. But most of the time you can figure it out using some of the tricks or some of the uh, results that, that have been presented here. But the key is to practice a lot.